Okay, next I want to introduce Deborah. Now, you could, you could introduce Deborah by saying uh, what she has done. But, but rather than telling you what she has done, uh, I want to tell you something about three um, ways in which things she could have done. So, in one potential life, uh, Deborah is a, a risk taker. She's a biker, uh, driving across the, the US, exploring the country, learning uh, what is going on. In another uh, potential life, she actually got to spend some time in a prison in China on a visit, not her fault, but this one. And in another, in another life, despite working very hard on obesity for a very long time, she is the proud owner of a very obese dog. <laughs> Deborah. That's what happens when you go to lunch with Dan. <laughs> okay. Well, I am really happy to be here and happy to be presenting work on behalf of our intergenerational lifestyle change team. We have a great team um, of, of members and we're looking forward to a very, very productive um, body of work. So let me just briefly talk a little bit about some of our thoughts and the concepts and the principles that are guiding some of the work that we're looking to do. When we talk about intergenerational lifestyle, we're really approaching this from a very different perspective. Usually when people talk about change, they talk about individual parents or individual adults, children, that kind of thing. But we're looking at behavior change across generations because all of us know that different things that we learn, we learn a lot from our families, right? Those of you who have eating patterns, a lot of your eating patterns began because of the way your mother cooked or, or introduced you to food because of the foods your father liked, different activities that you did, you probably learned from your family. These start very young and they are ingrained over time. So it's important to look at behaviors across time and across generations if we're going to talk about behavior change. Our group is doing that, and we're doing it around obesity. Uh, obesity is a great model to look at generational change. Um, obesity is currently a public health issue and has been for over a decade. Um, we know with obesity that right now, about a third of the adults are obese and about a third are overweight. So that's pretty much majority of our population. Um, and we also know that there's all kinds of chronic disease, over 30 chronic diseases associated with obesity, cancer, blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, which I'll mention in a moment. If we can shift the population weight just a little bit, five to 7% lower, we can have huge impacts. And a lot of that is related to behavior because behavior is a primary indicator of weight management and weight control. So we have a potential here to have true impact and have impact on a broad scale. So I want to use as an example just very briefly how obesity has developed so that we can look at it from a generational perspective. And many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the CDC maps. But they are very powerful in showing a generational approach to obesity. These maps um, basically go by state, and states asked people um, to report whether or not they were obese, and then recorded that accordingly. And so in 1994, we had about half the country where th um, the states reported that 14 to 17% of their adults were obese. By 2000, that was up to almost 21.9%, and by 2013, we're seeing greater than 26%. So over time, adults in 1994, about half the country, their children grow up. By 2013, we have even more of the country. It's a generational problem. We also know it's related to chronic disease. Diabetes, obesity is a root cause of type 2 diabetes. 
So in 1994, if you look at the diabetes maps, it, it really mirrors what's going on with obesity. The percentages are different, but these are adults reporting type 2 diabetes diagnosed. There's a lot of undiagnosed. So we have about half the country where up to 5.9% of the adults report diabetes. In 2000, we're looking at a darker country now, 7.4%. And by 2013, take a look. Type 2 diabetes is, is essentially greater than 9% in about half the country. So these are preventable, and this is largely behavioral, but it's happened over time. So what that means is that our norms have changed. The way we behave and what we're passing down across generations has changed. In 1970, immediately before the obesity epidemic really began, uh, we averaged intake of around 2,100 calories. By 2008, our average intake was up to close to 2,700 calories. That's a 23% increase. We're eating more. Why are we eating more? It's complex. Obesity is very complex. Um, but a good example would be that um, our, our sweetened beverage intakes, for example, half of the country has at least one sweetened beverage a day. Usually those sweetened beverages are about 200 to 250 calories. Um, that accounts for a significant part of the increase. Um, um, so those beverages, on average, um, probably have about mm, seven to nine teaspoons of sugar, depending on the size of that beverage. Um, if you drink a great big, the great big smoothies at the at the fast food places, um, those can have up to 700 calories. So it's not hard to see how we've got this differentiation with just really small with really small changes that could also reverse it. So what our group wants to do is focus on preventing childhood obesity, working with families with children at risk, and doing this from an intergenerational perspective. We want to make sure that we can stave the obesity epidemic, and we believe we can do it through this model of intervention. We know that the caregiver controls the food and physical activity environment of that child, and we know that the parent is the model of lifestyle behaviors. So they have a great influence, just as your parents did, on what that child will grow up eating and liking. We also know that we haven't been very effective. The maps showed it. Um, since 1980, obesity's doubled in our, in our young children, and it's quadrupled in teens. A third of our children today are overweight or obese. And a third of those born in 2000 will develop diabetes. So 15-year-olds today are going to be developing diabetes, unheard of previously, with, with really serious uh, medical sequelae associated with that. This was what was normal yesterday, probably in the late 60s, mid-60s. This is what's normal today. So it's changed generationally. We want to focus then on stopping intergenerational obesity, and we want to do that through what we call a lifestyle evolution. Obesity has evolved, lifestyle can evolve. This is very exciting in this approach and how we're going to do this. Um, we are going to rely on discovery, the evidence base that we have. We know so much about interventions, about how to prevent and treat obesity. We've done trials for a long time now, decades, and we've got a pretty good idea about the behaviors and the way to promote behaviors and environmental changes we know. Best example I know of, and we participated here at Washington University as one of the major sites, was the Diabetes Prevention Program. It was a lifestyle intervention, 7% weight loss, an overweight, diverse group of overweight adults, and it achieved a 58% reduction in diabetes. Great intervention. It was done in an ideal way. So it had lifestyle coaches, structured curriculum, supervised session, and it was very effective within that time frame. But over a decade's gone by, and we haven't gotten the impact from that that we should. It didn't translate well. So what we're going to do is take that evidence and work carefully as partners to transform the ideal into real world solutions. We want to package it so that it's relevant to the families we work with. It's relevant to families that are working two jobs. It's relevant to families that face financial stressors who have kids going in different directions. Make the science relevant so that it can stop, through behavior change, stop the obesity evolution that we see and instead have a life, what we call a lifestyle evolution. We're going to do this by working with health plans across the country, 
by intervening in families and in changing the home environments to support behavior change and working with the caregivers and children. Our first set of studies is looking at the peer coaching literature, which we have a lot of experience with, and looking at different models for introducing peer coaching as, a, as an, an additional way that we can work with these families to help stave off this generational obesity epidemic that we're seeing. So it's very exciting. It's taking the really good science and figuring out how to make it work through these systems of care to reach these families, these millions of families. And finally, we, we want to do interventions that have reach. We want to scale up these behavior change innovations so we can work again to get this across the country. Nothing, we want to take the ideal and make it real and have it reach out. What's so exciting about this for me is that I've worked on, and I do have a fat dog. I don't do trials on pets, I should. Um, I've worked on trials excellent trials for years, but this is so exciting because we are going to be able to really change the population, do a variety of studies, see what works, work with our partners to have reach across the population and achieve a population shift. We can do it with this model. We want to have impact and our team has that as the, as the primary motivation behind what we're doing and really joining um, academic science and joining with our partners with um, Centene um, to be able to really do this in a meaningful way.